Well, now, again, today, the government insisted that it's preparing for the possibility of no deal at all. Not deep and special, perhaps not even shallow and common. We've got some fascinating insights into that planning. We'll get that in a few moments, because I'm joined by two of our top editors to update us, Nick Watt and Chris Cook. And I have three Brexit expert guests <laughs> to work out whether a no deal is a go or not. So Simon Fraser was permanent undersecretary of the UK uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office till 2015. He's now managing, direct, direct, managing partner of Flint Global Limited. Jill Rutter is the programme director at the Institute for Government uh, and was also a former uh, senior civil servant. And Dia Chakravarti is the Brexit editor at the Daily Telegraph. Well, look, evening to you all. <laughs> Nick, start us off. Why are they talking now? about no deal. What's, what's well, it felt like this was a, a bit of rebalancing going on. These plans for a no Brexit deal have been underway for some time, but it wasn't really mentioned in the text of Theresa May's Florence speech, which was all about reaching out to EU leaders. She did mention it in the Q&A, so they wanted to sort of flag it up. But also, important to say, last Friday was a meeting of co-repa. That's the EU ambassadors in Brussels. Simon will know all about them. And that didn't go very well for Britain. There were some member states who said, oh, Florence, that was reach we should reach out to the UK. That was quite good. Two member states said no, not enough money on the table, and that was France and Germany. <laughs> no, just and two little ones. And they're the yeah. two member <laughs> states that we hope are going to come round and deliver for the us. The only two that matter. I mean, Chris, it feels like, in terms of this preparation, it's all on paper rather than in reality. That's right so far. And actually, if you go down to our ports today, there aren't new customs houses being built. There aren't thousands and thousands of new customs officials being hired and trained. We haven't restarted any of those processes. It's really a paper exercise. But I think that partly speaks to the fact that, for a lot of officials, certainly, um, the prospect of a sort of disorderly end to these talks, so no transition, no proper deal, um, is one that they're terrified of and they think it's something that just can't happen. And it really reflects the fact that the EU, one of the things the EU does is it says our planes are airworthy, our banks are solvent, our food is safe to eat. And if those processes break down and we don't have anything to, to deal with, whether that leads to a sort of just a bit of fudge which we have to sort of sort out on the night or something more serious, they just don't know. Simon, do you think no Brexit is a, is a serious, a no deal? is a serious option? Well, I don't think it's what the majority of people in the UK or in the EU, EU want, but I do think it is a serious possibility that we should plan for. I think con contingency planning is important, and let's face it, the record of contingency planning on Brexit hasn't been great so far. Uh, but when you look at the way the negotiation is developing, how slowly it's going, when you look at how complicated it is, when you look at the differences of approach in the British government, and when you consider that you're negotiating with 27 other countries, there has to be a chance that in the end you're not going to get there on the day but and therefore they... you need to think about the options. G Jill, don't you think they'll fudge it? I mean, I mean if, 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 we, if there's goodwill in the room and we haven't reached a deal, they'll stop the clock or they'll give us more time. I mean, it, 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 it's really got to be... So it. the question for you is, is that a bet you're prepared to take, basically? <laughs> uh, and what are the consequences of not taking it? So you could say, yeah, at the end of the day, we'll all sit down and agree. But actually, the, one of the things that's characterised the EU approach in this, it's taken quite a legalistic approach. And actually has quite a lot of rules it has. So say we go in and we all say, OK, we're getting nowhere, we need to extend Article 50. Extending Article 50 requires unanimity. That requires one stroppy member state to say, we're not extending, and we're only extending if you see sovereignty on Gibraltar or you do X, Y, Z that we don't want to do. So I think it really is, uh, is quite difficult right. to bank on that. Yeah. Dear, for, I think for you, because you're in the more Brexit camp, mm -hmm. for you, no deal is a positive opportunity, isn't it? You kind of, you're, not, you're not scared of it, is that right? I think we're going to have to make a, a no deal a positive opportunity. I don't think if at the end of the day we come away with a no deal, we can just say, sorry guys, we tried our best and now we're going to you know, fall off the cliff or whatever. So I think it is a good idea to prepare for it. Um, Rumour has it that there's about 25% chance, whatever that means. Remember, we've got a lot more negotiating to, to do, but rumour has it that there's a 25% of chance at this stage that there might be a new uh, no deal rather. If you were a business, you would be preparing for something like that. Indeed, the businesses have been preparing for something like that, as we've heard uh, several times. Um, so I think we should be preparing. Simon, can you imagine any deal that is worse than no deal? Because this is one of... I mean, is it plausible that they'll offer us a, a, a worse deal than no well, deal? Well, I mean, I think the slogan that, you know, um, a, a no deal is better than a bad deal is a meaningless slogan. Uh, no deal is a very bad deal. And the point is, even if you 
arrive at the end of the negotiation, you don't have a deal and you don't have a transition, you're still going to have to have deals. The idea that we're not going to have any sort of formal relationships between the UK and the EU <laughs> in economics, in politics, in defence, uh, in trade is just not tenable. I mean, after all, the Prime Minister today has proposed that we should have a bold new strategic offer in security and defence. So, uh, you know, they're going to have to be arrangements. The question is how you get there. And if you fell off the edge, there would be a very bad bump, in my view. I think it would be very, very damaging for our economy and for in many other aspects. And then we'd have to sort of claw our way back right. through so a whole lot of agreements. It would be a temporary thing, though, wouldn't it? I mean, well, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be what it is? It would fall out, there'd be a no deal, but we're not going to permanently have no deal. After six months, we'll reach a deal. Isn't that the expectation? Which is why this timeline set by the EU seems so artificial to me. Which is why, you know, if we're going to be talking about deals after we leave, why can't we talk about it you know, when we're working out how we're leaving the EU? That, to me, would be the more sensible approach. OK. Now, let me come back to uh, two Newsnight editors here. Because you've each got reports from inside the civil service <laughs> as to what this preparation means. And let us start with you, Nick. Um, and your project? Yes, it's called Project BATNA, and BATNA stands for the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which is a posh way of saying Plan B. It's actually out of a 1970s there we are. book called Getting to Yes exactly. from the Harvard <laughs> Negotiation Project. Yeah, there we yeah, are. Okay. And, and essentially what they're looking at is a series of scenarios, and the most obvious one is the talks collapse. But we do have a hung parliament, and I understand that they are also civil servants looking at a scenario in which the government collapses. And it's interesting, I spoke to a DUP source uh, who said that they are giving Theresa May until Christmas, so not much confidence there. So hang on, so the government for Falls. Yeah. Negotiations stall and because we haven't got have, a government. Exactly. And, that and that's have why we don't have a deal. Now, I spoke to wow. one very uh, senior former civil servant who said that is the sort of thing the civil service would do, but it would be so far under the radar you'd have no idea. And interestingly, the government this evening, what are they saying? We are not planning for this scenario. We're not planning for this. Do you believe that? I mean, Jill, Jill they, would, they would be looking at that. Well, I think one of the things is people are doing huge amounts of work actually on plan A and the sort of realistic plans. How much time they've actually got for some of this uh, <laughs> scenario playing? They do tend to do it during elections when the ministers are all gone away. We've just had some party conferences. That might have given people a bit of time to do it. But uh, you don't do uh, scenario planning for collapse of government in you know, full eyesight of ministers. <laughs> <by> <laughs> Simon might have done. We never used to do it when I was a civil servant. Okay. That would be quite brave, I think. Chris, because you've been talking to the Department for International Trade. Now, what's their prep? So, the IT, remember, is a sort of strategic department. It doesn't run in the thing. So, it only does big picturey things. And one of its sort of... Uh, one of the things they've been working on is something they've called internally Project After. And Project After is about what our trade policy might look like if we were to have a sort of basically a rank rancorous relationship, an acrimonious relationship with the EU. We have to sort of radically change who we are. And the things they've come up with are genuinely very radical. So one of them is join the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, a sort of collapsing currently. Leave Europe, join trade. Asia. That's, yeah, a, that's it's, one it's, idea. It's sort of, you know, US, uh, US, not US, Mexico, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea. It's, um, it's very, very Asian. <laughs> the, um, another idea is we could effectively slash our tariffs. And These are options, of, aren't they? Exactly. I mean, you they're sort of blue sky the things that they're thinking you might have to do. Exactly, to. exactly. And one of the others is we could set up free ports, which would effectively be areas outside our um, customs border, where we, and the idea is basically, it's a secret, it's a sort of not very subtle way of delivering subsidy to a town where we could try and build up a manufacturing base. It, that won't work, I can tell you, because <laughs> other com countries won't have it. <laughs> but these are things they're thinking about. So, they're, they're think so project after project BATNA, a lot of thinking going on. I mean, Simon, what, what do you make of these kinds of ideas? One... Well, on the trade thing, I mean, what, what's been described is the UK considering uh, joining every trade deal that President Trump is in the process of dismantling. By the time, <laughs> not a very good approach. No, the, the serious point is almost half of our trade in goods and services is done with the EU. And if we leave the EU, on whatever terms we leave the EU, that trade isn't going to go away. It's going to be done on less advantageous terms, and we'll suffer for that. But we're not going to sort of transport that trade to other markets rapidly. This whole idea about global Britain, that you can sort of leave Europe and trade elsewhere, maybe over time you can do that, but it's going to take a long time to shift the structure.
Yeah. There's a lot of trade that we do that is sort of trade in parts, where actually it depends on proximity. So, you know, we're not going to be part of an integrated supply chain with Australia, however much you might want to. So you can't really substitute some of those things, sort of Australia for northern France. But I think it's really interesting on some of these trade things is if you read the trade paper that came out today, is their real priority in the Department of International Trade is rolling over these agreements that were members of because we're members of the EU. So actually quite a lot of these future position, future partnership papers the government's been putting out are really about trying to sort of backfill to make sure we retain the advantages we've had through EU membership and we don't lose those on exit. Right. So and this then is we've like a, a trade, with South, trade with South, South Korea, Korea is exactly. via the EU yeah. at the moment yeah. and you need to redo that. I mean, these guys are poo-pooing the idea of global Britain. Not, not totally, but I mean, you, 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 you're a strong believer in that, right? You think I think that is one it? thing we mustn't forget is that uh, a, a no deal might be bad for us. A no deal isn't going to be good for the EU countries either. And we sometimes forget that. It is a two-way uh, sort of a situation, if, if you like. And while we always say, and Jill is absolutely right, uh, that a lot of our prosperity has depended on being part of the EU as well, a lot of EU's prosperity has also depend, has depended on us being part yeah. of that Eurozone, as well, the EU zone as well. Um, so we mustn't forget that. We mustn't always say, oh, they hold all the cards and we hold nothing. I think we do hold some cards. Simon, <laughs> I want to ask you something. If we, f we fall out, there's no deal. Mm -hmm. We heard that one cause might be a fall in government. Let's suppose that isn't the cause. We have no deal. Do you think the British government has to fall? I mean, is that, is that a sort of resigning matter for a British government? Well, I don't know how this is going to play out. And I think if we did get to that situation, it would probably be in circumstances of some political... Uh, upheaval, frankly, uh, but there are many ways in which, in which it might come, come about. After all, you have to remember, there are some people within the Conservative Party, possibly in the government, who actually favour no deal and don't consider it in any way to be disadvantageous. They think it actually is a beneficial thing. So, uh, as, uh, as I think Nick said at the beginning, there are different strands of thought here within the party, within the government, uh, and let's see how the balance of power plays out over time. Many people after all, are speculating about the longevity of the Prime Minister, and we don't know what would come after. But would you expect a Prime Minister who said, I'm optimistic, we're going to have a deal, would you expect them to, to, to resign if we were in the sort of crisis point of no deal, and then the, maybe the planes aren't flying and then the, the radioactive material isn't coming in? Well, I think there would be a crisis in government, and I think there would be many questions asked, and I think there would be immediate issues in real life to be resolved, which would uh, cause a lot of questions in the country. Thank you all very much indeed.